All right, it is um, 10 o'clock, so we will get started for today. Um, so let me pull up the PowerPoint. So we have just a little bit to cover from um, Wednesday lecture that we didn't get to. So we're going to cover that and then we'll go on to naming molecules, which is today's lecture. So just as a um, reminder, um, so can't hear me. One, um, can, it, can other people hear me? My mic says that it's going. So you can't hear me. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. So um, what we're um, going to look at today is, um, well, actually, what we looked at uh, Wednesday was uh, chemical bonds, looking at ionic versus covalent bonds, um, compounds, molecular compounds, ionic compounds, um, classifying stuff as ionic or molecular, looking at the types of formulas, um, looking at how atoms are presented, and looking at polyatomic ions. So the last thing we got to talk about is just when we find elements by themselves in nature, um, what, what form are they in? And so we have different types of elements. Um, some are called diatomic elements. And diatomic elements are found bond to itself in nature. For example, hydrogen, the first element. You're always going to find hydrogen in nature if it's just by itself as H2. Nitrogen, N2. Oxygen, O2. F, F2, so on and so forth. So any element that's in yellow there, you're going to find it bound to itself in nature. While those elements in that salmon color, they're polyatomic molecules, meaning that multiple uh, copies will be um, found when it's bound to itself. While everything in white is just going to be like a single copy, um, or, or rather, it can be a single copy or it could be in a solid where you're in some kind of solid matrix. Um, but the, the thing to really get from this slide is to know what are the diatomic uh, molecules? That's, that's mainly what we care about. I want you to know that all the halogens, if they're found in nature, it's never just going to be fluorine. It's always going to be F2. Oxygen, you're never going to find like one atom of oxygen not bound to itself if you're just dealing with pure oxygen. So that's the main thing that I'm trying to get across with that slide. What are the diatomic elements? and everything else um, you can't say is going to be diatomic. So what I want you to do is um, take a look at these. And I want to know if you found these in nature, would these molecules be atomic or would we find them as molecules like we just said on the last slide? Um, so let me launch a poll. Um, as this is an either or question, either atomic or molecule. So I'll get that launch and then give me a minute. Um, I need to set up my writing tablet as I just saw I did not have that. So I do that, please answer the question. We'll go over it.
So will these just be found as an atom in nature if it's just by itself, or will this be bonded in a molecule to itself? That, that's what we're really getting at here. Um, if you don't have a, a, the survey up, what I've heard other people suggest is if you go to the top, you might get like a pull down screen where it says pulls and you might be able to click that. Um, and, Cause once it's launched, I can't really like, if you can't see it, I can't really change that for you. Or I, I've heard other people suggest being like full screen mode, that might help. Yeah, so um, as I previously uh, just said, uh, some people have been answering it. So um, I'm not sure if you can't see it. Um, like I said, uh, other people have suggested going to go in the full screen mode, mode or if you can get a pull down to get the poll, uh, you, can, you can look at it through there. Um, if you don't have a poll, uh, you don't have to answer in chat if you don't want to. You can just write down write down the answers if you'd like. All right, so let me, I'll end this now share the results. So first we have neon. Neon is what's called a noble gas. So neon will never bind with anything ever. So neon's always gonna be atomic, no question about it. So neon's atomic. Um, hey, my pen's all the way up there, huh? Okay, so neon's atomic. Can't write, anyways. Uh, fluorine, fluorine is gonna be diatomic. Um, when you find fluorine in nature, it's always gonna be F2. So that's a molecule. Lead, uh, metal. When you're uh, dealing with metals, metals are gonna be atomic. Um, they're gonna be what's called a metal bond. Um, but they're not like molecules as we think about molecules. So lead is atomic. Oxygen, oxygen is one of those that will always be found in a molecule, O2. Same with hydrogen. You're never just gonna find a hydrogen atom. It's gonna be H2. So oxygen and hydrogen are molecules. Uh, so it's fluorine, lead, and neon are atomic. So any questions about that idea, when you would find a molecule being, or when you would find uh, an element as a molecule by itself or atomic by itself? And really just goes back to the last slide of um, those special exceptions that are gonna be atomic. All right. So let's go on to today's lecture then. Let me pull that up. Okay, slideshow, current slide. All right. So what we're gonna talk about today in most definitely it's going to bleed into Monday, is how we name all the compounds that we could ever come across for the most part. Um, how we would give it a, a uniform name, an IUPAC name. Uh, IUPAC is just the committee that decides how you name chemicals. And we're going to start with ionic compounds. And there's two different ways that you can name ionic compounds. Um, and that is 
if your metal forms only one type of ion or if your metal forms multiple types of ions. What I mean by that, and again, my pen is not co cooperating with me. Uh, what I mean by that is that if you look over here on this part of the periodic table, N, Ag, Zinc, and Al, right? So these metals can only form one type of ion. They're only always going to form one type of ion. That, that's just what they do, all right? Um, but all the other metals in the white here, they can form different types of ions. They can form ions of different charges. So depending on what type of metal you have, you will have different names for your ions. So that's the first thing you have to decide with ionic compounds. Is my metal only going to form one charge or is it possible that my metal forms uh, multiple charges? So we're going to focus on um, metals that only form one charge to begin with because those are the easiest to name. And what you do for these is that you just start off and you name the metal. That's all you do. So sodium, potassium, or calcium. Then for the non-metal, you give the first part of the name, and you add ide. So sodium chloride, because it's sodium and chlorine. Potassium and chlorine would be potassium chloride. Calcium and oxygen would be calcium oxide. So it's the name of the metal plus the name of the non-metal, and you just replace the ending of the non-metal with ide. So what we're going to do first on the left side of um, A, B, C, and D is that I'm going to give you two elements and I want you to um, write down what compound will form from that element. And E, F, G, and H, I want you to name that compound. All right, so I'm going to do A for you. So how do, how do we figure this out? Well, to do this, you really need your periodic table um, in front of you, unless you have all this memorized, which would be really impressive. Um, so if you have your periodic table in front of you, you need to find calcium. Calcium is element 20. Calcium is in the second column as well. It is in column two. Any metal in column two will always be a plus two charge when it forms a charge. So calcium is always going to be calcium two plus. Now let's look at oxygen. Oxygen is element eight. It's either going to be in column 6A or 16, depending on how you name columns. Oxygen, always, 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 well, 99% of the time in a compound is going to form a minus 2 charge. So calcium is a plus 2. Oxygen is a minus 2. And when you are making ionic compounds, the metal and the nonmetal, the charges have to cancel out. Well, if I have one calcium, which is plus two charge, and one oxygen, which is minus two charge, when I combine them, I get CaO. That's a neutral compound. And so that's the formula for my ionic compound. Now, not everything, not B, C, D, and E is not necessarily going to be one to one. So what I want you to do is either look at the previous slide if you have this slideshow open or get out your periodic table and start trying to figure out how these ions combine to make an ionic compound. And then E, F, G, and H is more simple. Just give me the name. So I'm going to give everybody a minute to do that or a couple minutes while I try to uh, uh, fix my tablet over here. But if you have any questions, um, do send me a chat um, because I will be looking at that. But yeah. Let's try to uh, answer these questions.
So those of you working, just give me one sec. I'm gonna restart my PowerPoint because my uh, my tablet is not working so well. So give me one sec. Um, I will get the PowerPoint right back up. So there's a question of when does an element change into a negative? Basically, if you're a non-metal, you are going to form a negative ion. If you're a metal, you form a positive ion. Uh, we'll talk about why that is um, later on in the semester. Um, but basically, that's, that's our rule of uh, thumb to begin with. I know you're probably not done, um, but um, let's just start to work through some of these as I try to get my pen kind of back to working. So aluminum. Wow, that is really bad. Um, aluminum. Okay. Pen's not going to work all that well, so I'm going to do it through my mouse, so my writing is going to be really bad today. Aluminum. If we look at aluminum, aluminum's a weird element and it's just kind of a memorization thing, but aluminum has a plus three charge when it forms an ion. Sulfur is right below oxygen. And so sulfur is gonna have the same charge as oxygen because they're in the same column. So sulfur will form a minus two charge. So that's, that's a two minus. All right, so we need to combine them in such a way that they're gonna be um, neutral. When we combine aluminum and sulfur, they have to have a charge of zero. The easiest way to do that, if they have different charges, you just swap the charges for how many atoms there are. So what I mean by that is that aluminum has a plus three charge, so I'm gonna need three sulfurs. Sulfur has a minus two charge. So I'm gonna to need two aluminums. So if they have different charges, just bring the charges to how many atoms it up. Wow, that does not make much sense when I say it out loud. But so sulfur has a minus two. You bring that two to the aluminum to say two aluminum. Aluminum has a plus three. You bring that three to the sulfur to say, I need three sulfur. And your molecule is gonna be Al2S3. Silver, silver is another one of those odd metals where um, it will only have one charge, but it's not obvious what it would be by just looking at the periodic table. But silver, which is Ag, it will have a charge of plus one. Chlorine, chlorine is obvious. So every single halogen, F, C, L, B, R, I, will always have the charge of minus one. And if they have the same relative magnitude, so plus one and minus one, or plus two and minus two, 
you don't need to change the number of atoms because just combining them as is will make your element neutral. So for silver and chloride, it's just AgCl. Aluminum and fluorine, well, let's combine uh, B and C. So aluminum, will have a plus three charge. Fluorine will have a minus one charge. Here we have different charges, so I can just switch around the atoms to get AlF3. ELF3 would be aluminum fluoride. How do you know silver has plus one? Uh, memorization for the most part. Um, and if we go back to two slides ago, this periodic table on the right hand side gives you all of the charges that don't change. So all the column one metals are always plus one. All the column two metals are always plus two. Then you have aluminum, zinc, silver, Aluminum's three, zinc's two, silver's one, and uh, uh, scandinavium, which we hardly ever use, but SC is plus three. So um, column one and column two, just remember plus one, plus two. Then you have four other metals that you kind of just have to know. Um, yeah, it's just memorization. No, no better way to say that until we get to electron configuration. And then I can tell you the reason why they're always like that. But any, any other questions on how we write um, the compounds, A, B, C, or D? And then I'll quickly go through the names as the names for E, F, G, and H aren't too bad. All right, so for E, we have magnesium. Yeah, my pen is horrible. Nitride. For F, K is potassium, so potassium fluoride. G, copper, with iodine, so copper iodide. Li is lithium, so lithium sulfide. So naming these compounds are relatively easy um, if they only have one charge. You just name the metal and then the non-metal and you add I to it. Any questions about that idea? All right, so let's get to something a little more complicated then. Well, we do have a question. Uh, wouldn't it be lithium-2 sulfide? No, it is not lithium-2 sulfide because lithium only has one charge. Um, if a metal only has one charge, I don't have to put any Roman numerals because I already know what the combination of lithium to sulfur will be. Sulfur will always have a minus two charge. Lithium always has a plus one charge. So if I have two lithium, I need two lithiums for one sulfur. What's the difference between magnesium nitride and magnesium nitrate? A nitrate is NO3. Nitride is just nitrogen. So nitrate's a different compound. Um, and we'll get to that um, in maybe not today, but it's in this like lecture. So we'll get to how we name something a nitrate or a nitrite but nitride, I-D-E, just means nitrogen. Nitrate means nitrogen and oxygen. Okay. So let's talk about how we name metals that have more than one type of cation it can form. This is where we use Roman numerals. So for example, iron. Iron has two common ions it can form. It can either be iron two plus or iron three plus. And so when we have a compound with iron in it, we have to tell, um, we have to name it 
to be explicit about the ion that's forming. So we have to say it's either iron two or iron three. And so to say what ion you have, you use Roman numerals. Chromium, chromium is usually either two plus or three plus. So you would put, um, if it's three plus, Roman numeral three. And if you have the compound chromium bromide that has Cr3 plus, you name it chromium three bromide. And the reason for that is that, let's imagine that you had chromium two plus instead. Well, if you have chromium two plus and you want to combine that with bromine, your, your molecule is then CrBr2 because that would be chromium two plus and that would go with two bromines. So when naming polyatomic, or not polyatomic ions, when naming ions that have metals with more than one cation, if you don't give me the Roman numeral, I do not know how many bromines go with that element. So if you just walked up to the street uh, to me, and you gave me a flask and said, this is chromium bromide. I don't know if there's two bromines for one chromium or three bromines for one chromium. If you said chromium three bromide, I know exactly what I'm working with. Copper, same idea. Uh, copper is either plus one or plus two. So it would either be copper one oxide or copper two oxide, and that would change how many oxygens go with copper. So if you're not a column one or a column two metal, or aluminum, zinc, silver, or scandinavium, you are a metal that has more than one cation. So I, every time you see that metal, you have to put the Roman numeral to it. Um, those of you who um, are interested, uh, we did have older names. So you can still, still see these names used, especially like ferros or ferric. Um, that would just say, you know, what type of iron you have. We don't use that anymore. Um, we use Roman numerals now. That's, that's how we um, make sure if it's iron two or iron three. Um, any questions about that idea? And then we'll get to some practice. All right. No smiley face. Okay. Well, I'm glad there's a smiley face, not no frowny face. All right. Name the compounds then. I will do A, just so we're all on the same page of how to do this. Okay. Every single metal I give you for this question are um, metals that can form more than one ion. Your goal is to figure out what ion we have, right? So there's a couple ways you can do this. The easiest way um, is just to see, you know, what, how many anions do you have? That's probably the easiest. Because remember when we were naming ionic compounds or writing down ionic compounds previously, and I said, if they have different charges, just swap the charges with how many atoms you have. So here, I have three oxygens. Well, if I have three oxygens, that means I was dealing with iron three plus. So I would name that iron three oxide. So let me get, try to do this with pen. Iron three oxide. Another way you can do that, that's not the, only way, actually, that's not the way I do it. And the way I do it is probably a little more complicated for you, to be honest. Um, but the way I do it is that I know oxygen has a minus two charge, right? And I know there's three of these. So overall, my oxygens are contributing minus six. And when I combine that with iron, I have to negate all my charges. So oxygen is minus six. 
I have two irons, two times something that I'm gonna call X has to equal six. So two times X equals six, X must equal three. So I have to deal with iron three. So it is iron three. To me, that makes more sense because I know oxygen is always minus two, sulfur is always minus two. I have these charges in the back of my mind. But if you just look at the anion, how many copies you have, that will tell you the charge of the cation. That works just as well. So with that in mind, um, give everybody um, a minute or two to try and tell me what are the names of these compounds. You have if you have answers or questions, feel free to uh, type those to me. How do you know the charge of chromium if it's a transition metal? Again, you look at the anion. Sulfur is always minus two, right? So I know what the charge of sulfur is. I know there's three sulfurs. So to neutralize the chromium, which there's two chromiums, um, I just, I, I kind of do math. So um, like I said, the, the easiest way to do it is just see how many copies of sulfur you have. That will be the charge of your chromium. So I have three sulfurs. So my charge of chromium is uh, plus three. Another way to do it, a much more complicated way, is um, you say chromium and sulfur have to combine in such a way to be neutral. So if sulfur is always minus two, and I have three of those, then the charge from sulfur is minus six. Now, chromium has to be plus six, right? So chromium has to be plus six for it to be a neutral compound. 
I have two of those. If I have two of those and they have to equal plus six, what's my charge? My charge is three. So for chromium uh, sulfur, that's chromium three sulfide. For C, that is iron three chloride. I have three chlorine, so that's iron three chloride. For lead, I have four iodines. So that's lead four iodine. So that's probably the simplest way to uh, figure out how to name these. But yeah, for those transition metals, to determine the charge, you have to know the anion charge and kind of back calculate. That's probably the most robust way to do it. So just at, um, I'll just repeat the answers again. Chromium three sulfide, iron three chloride, lead for iodide. All right, any questions about how to name metal ions that have more than one charge? All right, so let's go on. How about polyatomic ions now? This is where it gets a little confusing just because the naming scheme isn't as logical as we just saw. Like naming something like lead three, um, iron two, that makes sense because you're just naming the charge. But if they're polyatomic ions, we need a way to name them. And basically what's happened is that for um, polyatomic ions, we just give them a name. So they, the names of these have been decided through um, a committee, a committee of scientists who just sat down and decided how to name everything. Now, when we talk about polyatomic ions, most of them contain oxygen. And if an ion contains oxygen, we call that an oxyanion. And there's kind of a scheme to go with these oxyions. So if an oxyion has the ending of ite, it, like nitrate, that means your compound has two oxygens in it. If it ends in eight, ate, that means your compound has three oxygens in it. Note, this is not uniform. If you look at chromate, chromate has four oxygens in it too. So um, the naming is kind of all over the place. But if you see something like hypo, hypochlorite, that's usually below it. So hypo, um, hypo means below like hypodermic needle is below your dermis or your skin. So if you're hypochlorate or chlorite rather, that means you have one less oxygen than chlorite. So hypochlorite is ClO minus because chlorite is ClO2. Per means above. So if you're perchlorate, that means you're one oxygen above chlorate Chlorate has three oxygens, so perchlorate has four oxygens. Does this it eight only work with O2? Um, basically, these, the, these names only go with like oxyions um, for the most part. And there's contradictions all over the place. Acetate ends in ATE, but it has two oxygens. So honestly, the best way to learn these is probably through brute force memorization. Um, 
and after a while you'll they'll just start to click like phosphate and again ends in ate but has four auctions usually the eight and eight only go for if there's multiple versions so nitrogen with oxygen you can either have two oxygens or three oxygens that's when the eight and eight usually comes in chlorine can have four different forms with oxygen so that's why you get hypochlorite chlorite chlorate perchlorate um, but that that's our general naming scheme for polyatomic ions it, it, you just look them up in a table um, and you find out what is the name and the name like i said was decided through a committee um, they're uniform so every time you see the word cyanide you know it's cn minus um, because back 100 years ago 200 years ago well probably not 200 but 100 years ago people just use names whatever or use whatever name they wanted so if i was talking to a scientist in china they would have their own name for cyanide that was different than mine we don't want that to happen that's why we got these uniform names um, not the best system but it is some kind of system so let's see how we use these so how we use these to name um, molecules is that first we have to decide if the metal that we're using has one charge or multiple charges so we're going to do a together so we look at copper copper is element 29 it's in the middle of your periodic table Based on its position on the periodic table, I just realized my camera was off. Based on my position, its position in the periodic table, do you think copper has one charge or do you think it has multiple possible charges? And that's a question for anyone to answer. Does copper only have one charge or could it have multiple charges? So we have one vote for multiple, two vote for multiple. Anyone else? Multiple, 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 one, one, multiple, one. All right. So just as a reminder, I'm going to go back to um, a couple slides. So forgive me for going faster. As a reminder, the only charges that have one ion is either the group one metals, the group two metals, aluminum, zinc, silver, or Scandinavian. Everything else will have multiple charges. Copper comes in multiple charges. It can either be like copper one or copper two. So since we're dealing with a metal that has multiple charges, we have to use Roman numerals. So I know for copper, I'm gonna use Roman numerals. I just have to figure out what the charge is, okay? So I see, and I see that it's bound to one copy of nitrite. So NO2 is a polyatomic ion. I only have one copy. Since I only have one copy, that means the overall charge from my anions negative one, because nitrate is negative one. And I only have one copy, so copper is plus one charge. So the way to name this molecule, it would be copper Roman numeral one. Then you just name the polyatomic ion nitrite so this is copper one nitrite so for b c and d your first goal is to figure out does my metal ion can it have more than one charge or not if it can you need the roman numeral if it can't, you don't need a Roman numeral. Then try and give me the names with the polyatomic ion chart shown to your right. 
and we will work on that. That will probably be the last thing uh, we do today. So let's see if we can figure um, that out. A is a Roman numeral one, uh, that's copper one, because I only have one copy of nitrate and O2 is one molecule. Yeah, my, my tablet is not calibrated correctly. So um, that's why my writing looks really weird today. So if we look at B, we find magnesium. Magnesium is element 12, and it's in the second column. Metals in the second column, except for beryllium, BE is your um, one example where that's not true. But every other metal in our second column will always have a plus two charge. So, I do not have to put a Roman numeral because it's a constant. It's always going to be plus two. So I can just name my metal magnesium. And then you just get the name of the um, uh, polyatomic ion, magnesium acetate. Just the name of that molecule. And let's see here. So if we go down to C, we find barium, BE. Barium is just three elements below magnesium. So it's in the same column. So it's going to be a plus two charge. Barium is only ever a plus two charge. If that's the case, I don't have to give it a Roman numeral. So we have barium. And then we look at our polyatomic anion. It's NO3. NO3 is nitrate. So this is just simply barium nitrate. And since we're running low on time, let me do D here. Iron is element 26. It's in the middle of your periodic table. Iron is a transition metal. So it does have multiple charges that it can take. And so we have to give it Roman numerals. We see that OH, we have three copies of OH. So since we have three copies, that means our iron was plus three. So this is iron three, so the Roman numeral three here, hydroxide. So OH 
It's called hydroxide. So that is how polyatomic ions work into naming ionic compounds. Um, it's basically the same thing that we worked on today, except the polyatomic ion gets a special name. But again, just as, I'm gonna say one more time, for ionic compounds, that is a metal plus a non-metal, you first figure out, does the metal only have one possible charge? Or does it have multiple possible charges? If it has one possible charge, naming's easy. You just give the metal plus the anion name. If it has multiple possible charges, you have to figure out what the charge of, is of your metal. And you can find that by figuring out how many anions you have. And then you just give the name of the metal, so iron. What's the charge? So iron three. What's the anion? Iron three hydroxide. There are any questions about those ideas? Well, if you do have questions, please don't um, hesitate to let me know, email me. Um, we will finish naming on Monday. I will put a homework up as always. Please do that by Sunday at midnight. Otherwise, um, if you'd like more practice, um, please see me or our SI leader. He can help you as well as he's taken my class before. Otherwise, I have nothing left for you for today. So I wish you all a good weekend and I hopefully will see you on Monday. Take care, everybody.